30 Odd Minutes is sponsored in part by Digital Dowsing. Who are you powered by? For the next 30 minutes, we will explore the unexplained. From mysteries beyond our galaxy. To ghostly phenomena in our own backyard. We will dive into our psychic abilities. And explore everything from conspiracies to the just plain weird. Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. If the truth is out there, we will find it. But only by sheer accident. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. It's great to have you with us. We've landed the mothership here in Washington, D.C., right in front of the Capitol building. Pretty good spot. Nice landing, gentlemen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank yeah. you. Nice. Yeah, thanks. Nicely done. We're cloaked, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. You kidding? Are you sure? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. We, you'd hear things pinging off the outside of the ship if we were. Yes. All right. Well, good deal. Good deal. Dr. Drek with us. We let him out of the lab. Yes. How are you? That's good. You have oxygen out here, don't you? Well. Not like the methane you pump into my joint. Well, I told you he'd figure that out. It can never take a hand. He never yeah, good. Never good. Well, it's good to have you here. Matt, how are you? I am here. I, that's, <laughs> yes. Andrew? I'm doing well, thank you. All right, good. And, uh, any hellos this week? Uh, yes. Greetings to Farmington Community Television in New Hampshire. <laughs> Thanks for uh, coming on board, and we know that your slogan is "Live Free or Die," but I'm pretty sure that when the mothership takes over, you'll see things our way. They will. They will. They will. Thank oh, by you. the way, let's uh, give a quick nod out to Sophie for this wonderful, uh, wonderful ah, Smurf artwork. Yes. yes. Thank you, Sophie, for the Smurf artwork. She's awesome. She's good. All right. So we are talking about uh, UFO disclosure and the U.S. government, and that's why we've landed here in Washington D.C., as you can see behind us. And, uh, and Dr. Dreck, we asked, we asked you for, for a little field report on, uh, on the idea of capturing evidence. Take a look. Greetings, oddballs. Dr. Dreck here. And you know what the main problem is with people trying to catch UFOs on camera is that the, uh, they don't have the camera at the time or they get it when it's too late. But I'm trying to solve that problem, and that's why I'm doing this remote broadcast here from planet Earth. My lab is in the background somewhere. And on top of it, I have a 24-7 video camera aimed at a specific place in the sky. And then when the day is over, it pulls all the highlights out so that I can see what I caught. We're bound to get some unidentified flying object. Let me uh, tap into the feed right now and we'll see what we got. No. No. Oh, that one looks prom. Oh, no. That's Gamera. No. No. How do you like that? <laughs> All these, all these guys got in the way. I mean, there could have been a UFO behind them, but no, no, we got to run into the giant claw and Reptilicus and Gamera and Rodan, you know, these camera hogs. Well, maybe better luck next time. Uh, oh, what's that? Oh, where's my camera? Ah, always happens. You don't yeah, have your I camera. Know. When I know. Up. Even when you're on a UFO, Even when you, you're forget. On, yeah. you forget to, to film these things. Always the way. But, you know, things are changing. Everybody's got cell phones with video cameras. and We've seen some out the... Windows of some airplanes. Uh, That's right. Over the past year, they've been pretty impressive. So it's it's interesting. We're we're, we're getting more stuff, but we're getting more noise as well. We're we're going to talk about all this. This yeah. is this is very exciting. I'm I'm excited about this because uh, we're going to talk about the state of the state of the union. How about that? The state of the union in regards to UFOs. Here's what happened. Between April 29th and May 3rd, 2013, in Washington, D.C., 40 researchers, along with dozens of UFO witnesses that included military, agency, and political persons of high rank and station, converged on the National Press Club to testify in front of six former members of the United States Congress on UFOs and extraterrestrials. The objective was to share what the witnesses and researchers know and urge the real Congress to fully disclose what the U.S. government knows. Tonight's guest was one of those researchers who testified in Washington. He's an investigative writer, author, and lecturer, best known for his UFO-related papers, columns, articles, editorials, commentaries, conference lectures, and media appearances. Tonight, he returns to 30-odd minutes to give us the lowdown on what the U.S. government is keeping on the down low. Please welcome, beaming to us live from upstate New York, Peter Robbins. Peter, you're sitting very still tonight. (laughs) Can you hear us? Breaker? Peter? Are you with us? It's a UFO show. It's a UFO show. It's a UFO show. This really is. As our fans know, every time we do a UFO show. I apologize, gentlemen. My little button was depressed, and I don't mean that allegorically. Okay. Um, Well, welcome back. 
Welcome back, Peter. Good to have you with us. Uh, if by voice, we'll work on the video. Uh, Peter, before we jump into this, we're actually going to play a, a short clip um, featured from the conference. It's the, it's the CHD commercial, so people get an understanding of what this conference was mm -hmm. about. We'll be right back with you after that. Take a look. The way government regains the trust of its citizens is by telling the truth. There is no other way, no shortcut. And I call upon our government to open up, like the Belgians have, the French have, the Brazilians have, the Argentines, the Mexicans have all released their files. It's about time now that we do the same thing and become a part of this planetary community. It is way past time for all of us to know what our own government knows, instead of being kept in the dark by a policy of denial. The last time the Congress held a hearing addressing the extraterrestrial issue was 1968, 44 years of sightings ago. In those four and a half decades, hundreds of thousands of new sightings have taken place. Government agency witnesses have come forward. Media coverage has expanded. Hundreds of documentaries have been produced, thousands of books have been written, and yet the United States Congress has remained silent. So for a period of five days, at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., two blocks from the White House and 12 blocks from the Congress of the United States, we're going to conduct a citizen hearing on disclosure of an extraterrestrial presence engaging the human race. 40 to 50 witnesses of high rank and station from military, from agencies and possibly from intelligence services, along with the top researchers in the world, will give 30 hours of testimony to five former members of the United States Congress. So maybe the citizens' hearing has a chance to try to leverage open some of the truth about the fact that we're not alone in this universe, that we might actually begin to look at what we really are, what the true history of this planet is, and that might be what gets us into a future without self-destruction. The model of the citizen hearing is if Congress won't do its job, the people will. Peter, this seems like it's, it's the, the dream testimony that, that you've, people like yourself, ufologists, have, have dreamed of giving before Congress. They wouldn't invite you in, so you, you did it yourselves. What, what was it like being at this conference? Yeah, I, I have to say, um, a lot of us in the field hoped for the best, expected something less, and showed up optimistic. Uh, I don't think anyone was disappointed, Jeff. It really was uh, above and beyond any event that's ever been put together like it. Um, Steve Bassett, our host and the organizer and the driving force behind it, had received a uh, extremely sizable donation from a gentleman in Canada, obviously of some means, who wanted to see this event happen. And really no expenses were spared. Leasing the National Press Club for five days, for starters, is a, a serious undertaking. Everybody that was there um, had full entrance and access for free. There were no associated fees. The Press Club uh, laid out a really nice breakfast and major buffet lunch every single day, snacks all throughout the day, um, several hundred people in attendance at any given time. I would say there were um, probably almost several hundred um, headsets with um, wireless attachments so that you could listen to any of the speakers in English, Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, one or two other languages. And yes, we had five retired congressional representatives, one retired congressman, who were paid a, a serious amount of money to come in and do what they used to do. Right. And that was another concern for some of us that they would simply, you know, put themselves through their paces and play act, but they became extremely engaged. And um, after a while, uh, a great deal started to come out about their understanding and experience or lack of same. Uh, over 40 witnesses from as far away as China, from as near as Washington, D.C., uh, heavy contingent of military witnesses 
uh, witnesses with an intelligence or um, uh, background in um, our uh, military industrial complex. It was all together fascinating. And as our congressional representatives agreed, there isn't a chance in hell that our elected officials are going to have the courage to ever do anything like this, right. short of a landing in front of your studio and in my backyard here and on their lawns as well. And so I'll tell you, they could didn't matter that they were retired. When you raise your hand and swear to tell the truth in front of a, a table full of congressional representatives, whether or not they're serving right now or not, you take it seriously. And uh, the testimonies, I thought, were not just very professional and informed and passionate, but as the congressional folks responded over and over, was backed up by a sizable amount of the kind of evidence that you could take into a courtroom case and win a serious felony. Sure, absolutely. Now, here's the thing, too. This, this, uh, this conference, we, we talked about this before, it, it got a lot of media attention. Some of the media said, hey, look at what they're doing. This seems serious. Others, of course, uh, you know, used, Typical, yeah, yeah, yeah. used it to, to, you know, made a mockery of the thing, um, which is yes. nothing new for anyone in the paranormal. Um, sometimes, That's right. Yeah. And, and so I'm curious, too, what, what are your thoughts on the reaction of the media? Uh, who do you think got it right and who do you think, you know, got it wrong as far as uh, the coverage of mm -hmm. this big event? Yeah, um, I would say um, at the top of the list of those who got it right was um, the Huffington Post. They had a longtime UFO investigator, um, featured writer for them for some years, uh, one of the most abiding names in UFO studies and one of our real media scholars uh, and um, that is uh, Lee Spiegel. Mm -hmm. And Lee had a daily blog. He essentially just did what any good news person should have done, which was report what was going on there as objectively as possibly and keep out of the way in terms of commentary or the usual nonsensical variations on wink, wink, nudge, nudge, right. uh, or all of the silly graphics that you can imagine. Um, the great George Knapp, um, certainly for my money, a leading, if not the leading, UFO-related newsman who comes out of uh, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, Emmy Award winner, I believe, he did a wonderful piece on it as well. But you know what? Even the New York Times did a respectful and respectable piece. And that, I have to say, for me, was stranger than UFOs themselves. Uh, right. The Times has a notorious history of debunking, condescending, belittling. I know it because I made it my business to study it in great detail. And they had a reporter there for several hours. Their photographer basically came and never left. He stayed for the next four days and kind of became one of us. And this is a longtime uh, photographer for uh, the New York Times. Um, the Washington Post, a silly puff piece, but there was a lot of news coverage. It was one of those weeks where um, Congress was out, uh, the president was on uh, a visit to somewhere. It was very quiet kind of couple of news days within the Beltway. So we certainly did get more coverage than um, any UFO-related event I've ever been part of. But most of it, of course, was still very sophomoric. What was good was particularly good, though. Right. And, and now here's the thing, too. You guys had, uh, I mean, you know, many retired military personnel, people whose, whose names and titles, of course, carry a lot of weight, oh, yeah. astronauts and, and, and so on, uh, all in yeah. one room now, all um, testifying you know, to, to the same degree, saying there's stuff going on that's, that's well above and beyond what, what most people know. And, and I'm curious, were yeah. there any revelations that, that were new to you, new to an insider like yourself, uh, as far as you know, you know, who that's knows what a, and when. A great, great question, Jeff. There were a number of them. Uh, I none of them qualified as you know life changing experiences, but each one of them was an absolute gem and fascinating. Um, some of the most impressive witnesses were military pilots. St some still serving, by the way, not all retired oh, okay. um, from s South and Central America. And one of the pilots, I think he was from. 
Uruguay or Paraguay, and I listen closely in United Nations quality uh, and level simultaneous translation on my headsets. And he was talking about that incredible archetypical situation where you've been scrambled, you see the thing, it's on your radar, you're being ordered to fire on it. And he, you know, uh, said a little prayer, pushed the button, and the missile refused to fire, and the thing took off. Right. Now, that in itself, we've heard accounts like that before, although to hear it from the individual in question and the passion in the voice in a room at that level of the game um, was beyond a novelty. It was very exciting. He then went on to tell us that it is not uncommon, and I, again, I'm forgetting whether it was Uruguay or Paraguay, for um, honorable um, Air Force pilots like himself to visit schools and give talks to school children about how seriously their military and their government takes this presence. Um, it's not in any, you know, protect yourselves children or panic kind of way or welcome the Space Brothers. They simply acknowledge at the governmental level that this is a real phenomenon. It is obviously off Earth. It is obviously well in advance of us. And there is such a news blackout that I occasionally have to be reminded of because it is so effective. That news hits the Rio Grande and falls down into the river. And it right. simply never breaks through here. It occasionally might in some you know, documentary special or, um, you know, a conference piece or what have you. Gee, that's a handsome fellow you've just thrown on the screen there. Yes. Um, yeah. And I am sorry, you know, because I, I dressed so specially for you. Um, and I'm not going to tell you whether I look like a banker, uh, whether I'm completely in aluminum foil, look like a princess or a superhero. <laughs> or all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You've got our imaginations running. Oh, up goodness, you do. Be. I know I would. Yeah. But it was, <laughs> you know, it was just a damn special event. Um, yeah. The representative from China, uh, from the largest UFO organization in China, got up there and told us that there are UFO related study groups all over the country with thousands and thousands of members but there are in excess of a billion Chinese who find this subject compelling, fascinating, and are doing their best to learn more. So Over a billion. Right. Now, numbers like that, if they're tossed around by Westerners with very little to back them up, don't mean much. That was an amazing moment for me. Um, and yet, once again, this stuff is so cleanly kept out of major and major and a half and minor to a degree media that even those of us that are in the field um, are simply not aware. Right. It, it just it begs the question, why, why the U.S.? I mean, other countries, Belgium, France, even the U.K., are, are tearing yeah. down these walls. Well, why, why do you think the United States, more than these other countries, you know, continues to, to keep these, these events secret? Yeah. I think part of it is just a terrible habit coming out of World War II. And remember, for me, um, looking at this in terms of 20th century history makes it doubly fascinating post-war history, namely that the Cold War, if you have to give it a date, most distinguished American historians will locate the official beginning in July of 1947, literally within a week of everything exploding uh, around Roswell, the Kenneth Arnold sightings, the Cold War, and the modern age of UFO encounters and sightings were born at the same moment. I genuinely feel that is a coincidence of history, but it is overlaid. And so immediately there was a curtain drawn around the president and his men having some sense of Truman, read his memoirs, his published letters and things, I think if it had been left up to him, he would have waited a few months and then gone forward to the people of this country and the world and said, this is what we know, we can get through this. And by that time, though, the legendary origins of so-called MJ-12, I think had kind of enculturated themselves and prevailed on the president to hold off and study the situation more. Of course, they're still studying the situation. And remember that 
being the culture that we are and also keeping in mind that these secret keepers are probably overwhelmingly um, white guys from somewhat privileged or um, culturally uh, limited backgrounds who this is their life. They are secret keepers. They are the ultimate insiders. Do you want to give up your job by basically blurting it all out in one historic moment? Also, part of the secret may be that we don't know much after 67 years or so of uh, concerted study, then we're kind of embarrassed about that, that we can't touch these things coming and going. Sure. And that certainly has to impact on the pride of these secret keepers, not to mention the military who, you know, um, do the bidding of, of us and those whom they're ordered to. Right. So. I, yeah. I think we're just so deeply enculturated with secret keeping in this country, we don't know how to stop. And there are bloody few people who are charged with declassifying. And there are millions and millions and millions uh, of secrets classified, several million classified in one bush year. So um, we are buried as far as that goes. And I have to agree with my friend and colleague, Rich Dolan, that there will never be an official president coming on TV, doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter what their politics are, this is an equal opportunity repression employer. Right. Um, it means that every previous president, liberal, conservative, democrat, republican, doesn't matter, is an unindicted co-conspirator in arguably the biggest conspiracy in history, and that doesn't look good. So they're kind of trapped in um, an invention of their own making. Well, Peter. You left out the biggest one, money. Yeah. Money. Thank you. And Matt hits. Matt wins a sixty-eight squadrillion dollar prize. The technology, exactly. The value of the technology. Right. And you know the military is looking at it with we can kill people with much cooler stuff than we've been doing it, and we will own the world. Um, all what about the money it costs people? to keep the secret? Those budgets are big dollars. Yeah. Right. And can you imagine um, the wrench, the scare, the panic that the announcement of a genuinely new, non, hopefully non-toxic, non-burning technology will throw into the petrochemical industry, into the stock market? Um, as Bud Hopkins used to say, uh, church attendance, mental hospital uh, admittances, and um, alcohol consumption will all go up. Uh, the stock market uh, will go down. Um, there will be panic among some. I think that uh, people of faith will weather this a lot better than other people think they might. I don't think it's going to conflict with their uh, ideas of a supreme being or what have you. Sure. But it's a son of a gun. And this event, which, you know, you're kind of like at a UFO conference, which this was not, you're kind of under a giant bubble. Um, we are in a judgment-free zone. Um, when we met um, in, in Massachusetts and at conferences Matt and I have done, whatever the subject is, everybody pretty much knows they can talk about it without anybody looking at it askance, unless they're a total weird ball, in which case we murder them and wrap their body in aluminum foil and sell them to the aliens. <laughs> We're but, sitting right here. Know, these things happen. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say that or think that? No, I have no, a fairly got loud, serious though. reputation here, but I feel like I'm, I'm robbing you of the psychic pleasure of not having me to riff off of and try to embarrass me and then see by my face that I am. So I, I kind of owe you another show here yes. where it'll be on camera, and I feel bad about this one. You know, Peter, you've already broken a record. Uh, mm -hmm. You were our first uh, three-peat guest, our yep. very first three-peat oh, guest. So, you know, oh, my so God. I'm, I'm so excited. What do I win? Let that soak in for a minute because we have to take a news break. And, you know, speaking of recent UFO sightings, I want to get your take on these. Let's take a break for the news. We'll be right back. So far, 2013 has been a good year for UFO sightings. On May 30th, two very unusual flying objects were captured on video in two different locations. The first UFO was seen in the skies over Lima, Peru in broad daylight and is unlike anything recorded to date. Witnesses said the object appeared to have the characteristics of a large jellyfish changing shape as it moved through the atmosphere. This bizarre UFO was videotaped by a news crew from Peru's Channel 2 
and the footage clearly shows the reported undulating white mass shifting its shape while passing over the city. One theory is that it might be a hoax made by someone lashing many dozens of white balloons together, but the object's movements don't seem to support that notion. Later that day in Mexico, a second UFO was videotaped flying into the top of an active volcano. The video camera has been set up since last year to record any changes to an active volcano, which is located 40 miles south of Mexico City. The locked-off video camera caught what appears to be an unidentified flying object moving over the volcano, then turn and fly right into the opening at its very top. This is the second time that this camera has recorded an object appearing to fly into the volcano's fiery maw. In November of 2012, a large cigar-shaped object was caught on video driving straight down into the top of the volcano. If these are in fact extraterrestrial craft, then the aliens just might be a big fan of the James Bond movie, You Only Live Twice. I'm Andrew Lake, and oddly enough, that's the news. Thank you, Andrew, and welcome back. Good to have you here. Okay, Peter, this is a question I know I've even asked you before, and we're going to go down the line. We're going to start with Dr. Dreck, then Matt, then Andrew. You're in charge of the world, which you may very well be for all we know. Mm. And, And you know that the aliens have been here for years, decades, maybe even centuries or more. Do you disclose it to the public, or is it more responsible to, to hold all or some of that back? Go. Well, personally, I feel that the human race needs to be shaken out of its smug arrogance, and I'm in favor of disclosure. All right. Uh, it doesn't have to be all at once. I think that would be a shock, but maybe in pieces, just so people get used to something, then a new one, then a new one, just keep getting to the truth. Matt? I agree with direct. I believe it should be a titrated uh, dissemination of appropriate information. Andrew? No, I would hold on to the information uh, greedily and not share it with anybody just because <laughs> that's the way I am. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Peter, we're going to end this with do it. we're going to end this with you. But but my thought too is you know um, could it be you know the the Hollywood movies, uh, even the, the the mainstream media making a mockery of it, you're still giving it attention, and attention that's is right. attention, you know. And could that? Could, could all of this be chipping away at the psyche of Americans? So if, if the mothership did indeed land, not cloaked this time, right there on the, the, the square in Washington, um, would the public be a, a, a little more able to accept it because we've had years and years and years of, of jokes and, and talks and things like that? You hit the nail right on the like head. That. Disclosure is going to probably come from them, not us. Well, yeah. right. I mean, so, so what, what are your thoughts, Peter? You're in charge of the world, which, you know, according to my Illuminati friends, isn't far from the truth. <laughs> what, is, uh, what do you tell I, them? If I say anything more about that, I have to kill you all. And <laughs> Fair I, enough. I want to do that because you're friends. Um, I think we are in the process right now. I don't think that the... Uh, the government is, is particularly pleased or not pleased about it. I, I think that they wish that this wasn't on their shoulders on a certain level. And um, like Andrew, I think there are those that relish holding on to such secrets. I think it is causing a schizophrenic split in um, culture, in history, in humanity, in our understanding of ourselves in the universe from a secular as well as um, a theological uh, point of view that we need to go through the eye of that needle and in fact we are doing it now in slow motion as we perceive it but it is happening right and uh where exactly it will lead us we're not sure but um what will be the spark that will ignite um so-called disclosure we don't know we can only make educated guesses and that's what it's all about so the exciting conference peter thank you for joining us we are right up and out of time the mothership has to decloak and take off here from Washington, D.C. And, and head on to our next mission. Thank you for joining us for the third time. Peter Robbins, we will have more links to the, the conference website and Peter's from ours. From us to you, folks, stay odd.